Hey guys, it's me, Robert Kennedy III, RK3. Thanks so much for joining me today. I'm excited. Can you tell I'm excited? Look at my face, excited. And thanks, thanks for clicking that play button and getting this thing started today. Welcome to another episode of Success Sessions. Uh, I'm glad that you were able to join me. This is actually a previously recorded episode for my previous podcast, What Success Looks Like, and for one technical reason or another, we didn't get to air it. But that's probably a good thing because the interviewee today, you, you hear me talk about purpose, power, and profit. The interviewee today, her name is Pamela Slim. If you've never heard of her, she is the author of Escape from Cubicle Nation. Escape from Cubicle Nation. And if you are in corporate, if you are an employee or a worker, and you're looking to make a change and, and, and get out and get into something that you're passionate about, something that you love, Pamela Slim is somebody that is perfect for that and you, and you want to hear what she's got to say. So thanks for joining. I want you to sit back, grab something to drink, something non-alcoholic preferably, and something that's going to keep you focused here. You write some notes and you're, you're going to enjoy this. Pamela Slim, Escape from Cubicle Nation. This is me again, Robert Kennedy III, RK3. Enjoy the success session. Purpose, power, profit. It's time for another three-piece success session with your host, Robert Kennedy III, RK3. Are you ready? It's time. Welcome to What Success Looks Like, where we talk about the stories that got people from where they were to where they are. And I like to say it's not about the money, it's not about the fame, it's all about how you play the game. And we've got a game player on the show today with us. I came across Pamela. Her name's Pamela Slim, by the way. Great name. I came across her. A friend of mine talked about this website, Escape from Cubicle Nation. And I had to go check it out. And I just loved what I saw there. And um, Pamela may not know how long I've been stalking her, but I've been checking her site out for a little while and uh, just really impressed by what she's done with people that are in corporate and just really re revolution, revolutionizing uh, the, the mindset of some people. So I want to give her the opportunity today just to share her story. We'll ask some questions, of course, but I just want to have her tell you how she got to be the, the, the cubicle nation slayer or what do you, whatever you want to call it um, today. All right. So how are you doing today, Pamela? I am doing great. So happy to be here. Excellent. Thank you so much for the time. Um, so tell me a little bit about the whole concept of escape from cubicle nation, first of all. Yeah, well, you know, it's really one um, fun and significant part of my own body of work, work that I've, I've done throughout my career. I, prior to doing Escape, um, 18 years ago, I quit my corporate job at Barclays Global Investors, which I really loved, actually. I've always been a very happy employee in, in whatever I was doing. And I was a consultant to corporations for about 10 years, and I really, really enjoyed the work because to me the joy is in how people work and how people work creatively, not so much what's that work mode that they're using. Right. But I found that within organizations there were many people that were really happy to be in that particular environment. You know, some corporation, corporate life can be difficult, but um, some people would actually like rather find the right role and stay in a corporate environment. But there was always a subset of people who would pull me aside and say, how did you do it? How did you go out on your own? What are the steps? And I was a little confused because there's so much great information for mm -hmm. free on the web and great books that have been written by really smart people right. about how to start a business. And so it just began to get my wheels turning about what was unique to the situation of people who had grown up in corporate life who wanted to start a business. And what I realized is there was a lot more psychological and sociological things that were going on with the transition as opposed to people just not understanding what the 10 steps are to start a business. Right. They'd essentially be abandoning an identity that many of them have worked very, very hard to get. And by the way, many families were very happy that they got. Right. Right. <laughs> so to chuck it all away and to do something more risky and entrepreneurial was a very scary endeavor. And that's really what inspired me to be starting Escape from Cubicle Nation, working with people, uh, which I've done over the last eight years. And now I'm in my own transition of kind of looping back around and, and coming back around to working with people and organizations. Okay. So was that 
a scary thing for you? Or how did you deal with some of these same fears that people come to you with? It's interesting because I, I've talked about this a lot recently, having done a lot of interviews about my book. And you know what's what's fascinating is we all have our thing, right? right? I have scary areas of my life for sure, like demons that I've slayed mm -hmm. <laughs> in different areas of life. Right. When it comes to entrepreneurship and taking risk, I have a huge tolerance for risk. Okay. At the point of being foolhardy sometimes, right? Of like when I was in my, you know, teens, I was an exchange student. I traveled by myself in South America. I throw myself into situations. So when I quit, I wasn't concerned. It was also 1996, which was a very healthy time in our economy. I was in Silicon Valley, Bay Area, right. and there was really, companies were growing. I had a very defined skill set where there was a lot of need, and so I did not have any fear okay. at all when I started, um, which in some ways is why it has been so important for me to really learn a lot by working with clients about what people face, because sometimes we teach what we know and what we do, so I could go out there saying, forget it. Don't be afraid. Just jump in there. Mm -hmm. To somebody who has a different tolerance for risk than I do, that would be really foolhardy adv advice right. because not everybody is wired the same way. Right. So do your clients um, mainly find you or um, do, you, do you pinpoint them? I guess I'm asking that because if you are targeting a company, that might not be something that the company might like as far as <laughs> finding out that their people yeah, are trying to well, go off. Definitely. Well, as I said, you know, when I started Escape eight years ago, um, I was very clear ethically to not be approaching any of the companies I'd work with as a consultant because right. that's not ethical. Mm -hmm. I had gotten good money. I had done really good work within the organizations in order to be encouraging a positive work environment. Mm -hmm. So that actually was what um, spurred me to create Escape from Cubicle Nation, the blog, right. is because I knew that I needed to be attracting people that would come from their own you know, without any kind of prior relationship that they had with me, which mm -hmm. is what, what I did for about eight years. And right. really to the person in terms of individual coaching clients, everybody has always come to me through the my online brand, through blogs and speaking engagements and workshops and all of that. Um, it, for the work that I that I did when I was working with individuals. Um, starting in about July of last year, I stopped working with individuals um, and as I said, I'm kind of shifting into a new phase of my career where I'm okay. kind of coming back around yeah. to be working with people overall about the new world of work. I mean, the new world of work is just a little bit more messy than it used to be in the past. Mm -hmm. And part of what I want to do is to build a bridge so companies aren't afraid of people who have a side hustle right. or entrepreneurs aren't afraid at the right time to go back and work for a company because I think we kind of have more in common than we think right. than we do. Right. So how did you know or what was the thing that told you that this blog would be successful for you? What, what was the thing that, that allowed it to kind of catch on with people? What were you doing? I had no idea. I was completely oblivious. I didn't even know what a blog was. It was actually an assignment for a class that I took about oh. online marketing. Okay. And I knew that I knew people were there because I had talked to many of them, mm -hmm. but you heard my ethical dilemma of yeah. not being able to go back and recruit. So I had no idea. I remember just sitting perplexed in my, you know, my home office. I had a tiny baby. My son Josh was like three months old. And I just knew that there needed to be a way that I could reach people. This was 2005. So this right. is before Twitter and Facebook and all these things. I'm, I'm sounding old, but that was, that was the way it was back in the day. Yeah. And um, so uh, a woman named Suzanne Falter had a class called Get Known Now, which is about building your online presence. Right. And uh, it was a, totally an adventure. Like, I thought it was really cool. We spent tons of time researching the market. I, I really zeroed in on wanting to help people specifically that were wanting to start a business as opposed to general career coaching that I had done forever. Right. And uh, then I started a blog, and it really was just a joy. I had worked some really big consulting projects so that I was able to take a year off for my maternity, my self funded maternity leave with Josh. Yeah. And really, I was just experimenting. And that was the best kind of possible place to work. The space in blogs was so much less crowded back then right. that it was much more of an, you know, of an adventure. And I just enjoyed every bit of it. I would have had no idea whatsoever if you would have told me eight years ago of where I would be today as a result of starting the blog. I would not have believed you. 
Wow. So so now you're saying that, oh my gosh, this space is so crowded um, and you kind of lucked out, for lack of a better term, because of when you started it. What about somebody that is starting now? How does somebody now make elbow room for themselves to, to kind of do maybe what you do? There's always going to be competitive constraints, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. where maybe there weren't so many people that were blogging about this particular topic eight years ago, right. there also was nowhere near the level of sophistication and understanding about how people can work virtually, about you know creating an online business, about all those things. Now we actually have a lot more resources and tools than we had back then. So any time when you're starting something, there's always going to be some creative constraints. The place that I always go to from a business perspective is you always have to be thinking about your business model. Right. You know, who are you really, really? What are your strengths? And is there a problem that you know that you really can solve? A blog in many ways is just a way in which you can begin to reach out and you can connect with people so that they know who you are and they can have an experience about, you know, what you're about. Right. Be helpful, share tools and, you know, get people excited about connecting with you and eventually working with you. Right. But what leads to having a successful practice is where you're just absolutely focused on who are the people who I want to serve? Do they have a problem that they're willing to put money down in order to solve? Right. And how can you make that happen through a variety of different means? That's always going to be the place that you want to go because right. it's not magic. You know, you start a blog and you get famous and it just doesn't work that way. You yeah. have to really work on the basic principles that have always been in existence for, for businesses since the beginning of time. Okay. So tell us about your, your book now. So the book, uh, Body of Work, Finding the Thread that ties your story together. And so you don't get from one place to the other without there being a story. Tell me a little bit about the concept of the, of the book. Yeah, well, it's neat that, you know, I think we share that fascination for people's stories based yeah. on what you're saying about the story behind success. And what I found now in working in so many different work environments, mm -hmm. right? I worked in nonprofit sector. I traveled abroad a lot. I worked in Latin America. I ran a nonprofit as a volunteer for 10 years teaching martial arts. Um, I worked in a corporate environment. I did corporate consulting. I did startup consulting. Mm -hmm. Now I'm doing speaking, you know, creating products for the corporate market. And so a lot of people now are going to be in really a similar kind of situation where when you have the standard of just instability, economic instability, right? That, that's our new normal. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I'd love to be proven wrong, but I don't think I will be, right? right. It's politically less stable than it ever was, economically unstable. So more of us by choice or by force are going to be in situations where we need to get work and we want to get work. Mm. I think as a framework for thinking about our career, the focus is what is that body of work that we want to create throughout the course of our lives right. that will make us feel very proud and leave the kind of legacy that we want to leave. Right. And by body of work, I mean every aspect of our life. How are we as a son or daughter, as you know, husband or wife, parent, community member. Um, what is that work we're actually creating? What really is that footprint and that legacy that we're leaving? That that's really what we want to do. So, in order to create that, we may choose a number of different work modes. Right? We may have a stint in a corporate career and really enjoy that. For some people, they find that they just want to do something more meaningful and creative. So they might spend some time in a, you know, doing a startup, work as a freelancer, whatever. Right. Then they might get passionate about a nonprofit project and they might work on that for a few years. That's, I think, what a lot more people are doing. So there's some specific skills that are required for really you know, making sure that we all stay competitive. And really the meta skill, you'll be happy to know, is storytelling, yeah. right? Anything that you want, if you want a job and you do an interview, if you have a product for sale and you need to create a sales page, if you have a Kickstarter and you want to create a compelling campaign, if you are speaking and you want to convince people of an idea, move them to action, it's all about our ability to tell a really great story. Right. In uh, a story that really reflects who we are and you know what our strengths are in a way that really connects with your audience. Right. So that's... That to me is what was exciting about this book. I mean, it certainly is a way for me to understand my own career, which I actually did. But also my dad's career is, is really one of the strong parts of the narrative in the book because my dad, at 79 years old, actually interestingly displays like all the, the core skills 
in the new world of work. And like he's been around for so long, but that's really what I now realize through writing the book and interviewing him. That was the kind of model that I always had to look to, which is maybe why I, I wasn't so scared or nervous about making changes because I always had, for both my parents, a very strong and positive encouragement to pretty much do whatever random weird thing that I wanted to do next, right. which is not always the case for yeah. many people. Okay. So a uh, couple of questions before we wrap up here. So m- number one, um, when people are making this transition from corporate to side hustle or to whatever it is, yeah, what is the biggest question that you, you constantly get from them? With in with regard to how to, how to undertake this process, where do I start? Okay, it's always where do I start, right? I'm here. I have this idea. You know, either I want to get a promotion, I want to shift to a different job, I want to start a business. You know, I want to do this great new project. It often is really overwhelming to know what you want to start. So my very standard advice always is to begin to scope out some very clear and realistic projects. Right? It's all about. What are you actually going to create as a first step? Right. And generally creating that first step is a much smaller piece of maybe what your eventual thing will be, right? If you want to end up being a, you know, one of the main uh, newscasters on Good Morning America, maybe this is exactly where you're going to start, right? right? You're going to start, you're going to you know, do interviews, get practice, but it, that's really the place that you want to go is like, what can I actually begin to create next? The place where most people get stuck is just in in their head, right. planning, researching, planning, researching. So I'm one of those really annoying people who's like, you're on the edge of the pool. I'm just going to give you a little bit of a push because you have to go in the water exactly. in order for everything to make sense and for you to know what you actually have to do to swim. Right. So in your world, then, I mean, you said that you didn't really have the fear factor that a lot of people do. No. So what was the biggest challenge then that you had to overcome in in building what you have? For me, it was actually really lack of you know lack of knowledge because mm. I'm a liberal arts major. I didn't have I had background in business from working in a company and, and you know learning and understanding, but I didn't have um, any kind of official business training for right. really knowing you know how to run my business. Mm-hmm. What I learned is because I had run a, a nonprofit organization as a volunteer for ten years, I hadn't made the connection in my head that that was actually entrepreneurial work, which it is. Right. I know it seems so obvious, but it wasn't at the time. You know, right. I was like, that's my volunteer stuff. What the heck does that have to do with being an entrepreneur? It actually right. has a lot to do with it. But um, that was really the part I think that was the biggest challenge for me. Now there's so many younger folks who are amazing, who are starting things and going on their own earlier and earlier. I was 30 when I went on my own, right. but you know I don't have a master's degree, I don't have a PhD, and a lot of the people that were my my competitors within the environments that I was working in within high tech in Silicon Valley mm-hmm. were much more experienced on paper, much more qualified, and so that was really what I had to do is quickly figure things out, prove value, build relationships, and that was the part that was you know both difficult but also exciting. Okay. I think that's what kept me on my toes. Okay. So in a few words then, what is the most important thing or piece of advice that you give to people that are making this move? Um, is get clarity about what you are really looking to do. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you can't define specifically what it is. So you might know if somebody says, you know, I really want to start a business. I would say get clarity about, you know, what is it about, why do you want to start it? What is the particular, you know, kind of situation that you want? Is it you want more time with your kids? Do you want to have meaningful work? Just begin to really define and clarify specifically what it is that you're looking for in that next opportunity. And then from there is where you create a project, something that's concrete that you can deliver that has a timeline. And that's where everything happens. Very often, we start moving in this direction and we end up totally going a different direction. Right. Because that's the way life is. The more information you get, you can adjust. So it's not about just making one plan and going towards it. It's fine if you change, mm-hmm. but if you never get started creating something, then you're never going to have the information you need to know what actually is the right path for you. Right. Awesome. So the last question then is for you, what does success look like? Success for me is enjoying my life while I am living it. 
<laughs> good. That's, that's, so that, that's the basic. That's the basic definition. I actually have a whole yeah. chapter on success in in body of work in awesome. my book. What that means for me, because I do love the work that I do. For me to be happy doing what I'm doing, it yeah. means that I am doing meaningful work. You know, with people that I really enjoy. It means I'm present and available for my children, right. and I'm an active mother, and they feel my presence, and I'm you know with them as much as I can. Um, it means that I'm taking time to be healthy, you know, that I have enough money and resources to take care of my family's needs. Yeah. But the summary of it is really in just really waking up every day and being thankful for the day and enjoying what I'm doing. And the good thing is that's more a mindset. So yeah. it doesn't matter what's going on. If I can always remember that that's what makes me happy, then I can control that every day just by remembering to have gratitude. Excellent. Thank you so much, Pamela. This is what success looks like. Remember, you can go find out more about Pamela by visiting escapefromcubiclenation.com. No dashes, no underscores, no anything. Just escapefromcubiclenation.com. Pick up her book, Body of Work. You can grab that on Amazon or Barnes & Noble, and you can get some really great advice, some really great thoughts as you create your own story and move towards your dream. And I'd like to say at the end of the show all the time, be bold, be exceptional, and remember that each moment is just an opportunity for you to create something new. This has been What Success Looks Like. Pamela Slim, Robert Kennedy, have a great day. Thanks.